Good morning uh, and welcome back. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, first off, I just want to take a moment and uh, introduce our panelists. So my name is Alex Glazer and I will be uh, trying to uh, do my best to moderate this panel. Uh, we have uh, wonderful people joining us here this morning on this panel and I'm very excited to uh, give everybody a chance to introduce themselves. So I'm actually going to start with Eugene at DG Logic. If you wouldn't mind just taking a couple of minutes and kind of giving an overview of your company, but also for the audience, because really the goal of IoT Labs is to help you know answer some of the unanswered questions. What is DG Logic doing today that's kind of helping the IoT move forward? I think we're having a little trouble with audio here. Okay. Um, next, I'd like to uh, go over to um, Adam Dunkels. Yeah, hi, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, okay, yeah. Okay, excellent. So my name is Adam Dunkels. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, ThinkSquare. Uh, ThinkSquare is a platform for building connected products. So everything from the firmware that goes into the wireless chip that you put inside your physical item, uh, all the way out to the smartphone app that you give to your customers uh, to interact with your product, and of course the, the cloud stack in between that, that makes it tick. Uh, we founded ThinkSquare in 2012, and we are now deployed in a couple hundred thousand units spread out over a handful of customers and are ready to uh, roll out the, the first public version of our system later this spring. Great. And uh, next, I'll hand it over to Alex. Hey, I'm uh, Alex Duncan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Golgi. Uh, Golgi is a tool set for IoT app developers for moving data between their things and their mobile apps or their things in browsers and their things in servers. So we give them a very simple, uh, easy to use tool set that's native and builds native code for their, uh, their specific thing or their specific backend in a very simple and easy to use manner. Great, thank you. And uh, next I'll hand it over to Phil. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, Philip Dasatels, I'm the director of the All Seen Alliance. The All Seen Alliance is a membership organization of uh, 150 companies who all come together to create an enabling platform for the Internet of Things. We're the, uh, building an open source software framework that lets things talk together on a local network. I think the, the best line I've heard is, you know, why, go, wh wh why talk to the cloud to turn on and off the light that's an inch away from you? Uh, the All Seen Alliance uh, framework works with uh, or, or you know fits in with a lot of the other members who are here uh, on the panel, and uh, really it, it is meant to put some enabling technology in the hands of the widest bit of the audience possible. And I look forward to talking to uh, to answering questions. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, let's try and go back to uh, Eugene here and see if we can uh, get a little audio from him. Hello? Okay. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, we can hear you. There we go. Sorry, guys. Uh, technical troubles. Software company always has technical troubles. <laughs> yeah. So we're DigiLogic. We're in, in the IoT space. We've been around for about eight years now. Uh, and what we have is twofold. We have an application enablement platform, which essentially is the uh, connectivity and, 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 and uh, data transfer between devices, services, and applications. And our flagship product, actually, our commercial flagship product, is a product called DigiLux. It's DigiLogic User Experience, uh, which is essentially a IoT application development platform, which consists of, of uh, visual drag and drop creation of any sort of web application utilizing IoT data sets. So uh, now I'm going to kind of start the panel off by, by um, you know, just warming up here a little bit and direct some questions at people. And then if you'd like to comment, feel free to, uh, you know, chime in as we get going. But I'm going to start um, with Adam at uh, ThingSquare. And just the one of the things that um, I was curious about is as you're, you know, kind of connecting um, these different, you know, physical products um, with, you know, smartphones and, and things like that. Um, what are the, the challenges that you're running into from an app development or tool standpoint um, that you, you're addressing today? Well, I, I think we're, we're seeing a, uh, the major problem that we're seeing is that is all this very new. It's very new, the, the uh, uh, connect, connecting stuff together building apps to use the stuff that you connect together. 
building the, the cloud backends to deal with the data, the connectivity, and all that is still very new. Of course, we, we have a history of M2M solutions and all that, but, but to most people, this is very new. That means that a lot of people don't know where to, where to start, how to approach this. Uh, I think that's the kind of the, the number one problem we're seeing is, is just you know, knowing where to start. Uh, of course, we're, you know, in any of these areas, you see a lot of technical difficulties. Uh, if you're looking at the wireless, uh, the chip that you put into your, your product to mesh up and do the, the wireless stuff, that's just really hard. I mean, wireless is hard. Embedded programming is really, really hard. It's hard to find people who know how to do that. Uh, so all that is very, very hard. Uh, app programming is much more of a known problem to address. It's easy enough to find people who can write sm smartphone apps for any platform and all, you know, get that beautifully done. But, but the wireless side is still really hard. And uh, on the cloud backend, you have a lot of experience with, with building uh, uh, backend server software over many years. So again, that's a bit easier than the, than the wireless side. I think what we're seeing is that as people and customers move into this, uh, they're seeing their, their greatest problems right now is, is getting the kind of the, the physical thing connected is, is really hard. Uh, even though we're, we're, this is maturing up, it's, it's still very hard to get that going. Uh, once you've got that connected to, to a back-end server and, and the app, you know, that, that gets a bit easier, but, but still it's hard to start. It's, uh, most people don't know where, where to begin. Um, and so now I'm going to move on to Alex. Um, you know, Alex, one of the things, you know, as I was looking at your company and kind of understanding how you all sort of simplify connectivity and data transport, uh, you know, I immediately thought, you know, the different types of data and the issues that arise there and, and the development tools required to kind of smooth that uh, transport and, and efficiency. Can you sort of speak to some of the challenges or how you all are addressing some of those uh, issues? Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted. To, um, yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I think, I think the complexities that we're seeing for IoT developers is that there's a, a huge range of complexity of systems for, up, for, for IoT developers to get their heads around. They've got the thing, they've got a hardware, they've got an operating system on that, they've got a development environment on that. They've got a, a mobile app. Usually they've got to figure out the mobile apps. They've got to figure out a range of operating systems for that. They've got a, they've got a back-end server. They've got to figure out back-end servers. Are they going to use uh, cloud-based servers? Are they going to have enterprise-based servers? Uh, and, there, there's a, there's a, and they've got to understand the connectivity and transport between those issues. They've got to understand things like storage. They've got to understand things like authentication. They've got to understand things like standards. The huge range of requirements for for IoT developers trying to get get their heads around, and this kind of makes this kind of thing really uh, suitable for for tool sets. So I think if you can come in like we are with Golgi, come in with a tool set that takes one kind of sliver of functionality out of that uh, big complex arena and make it available across that complete spectrum of things and back-end servers and mobile apps, and offer that to app developers or to to IoT developers then I think you can take a lot of pain away from the IoT developer. And what we try to do in Golgi is we try to say, you know, there, there's a big thing that we have an expertise in. We, we really focus on delivering uh, what we call bits, bits, bits be from your thing or your thing to your back-end server, your thing to your, to your mobile app, and we do that really, really, really well. But we want you as an, app, an IoT developer to focus on the functionality of your thing and the UI and the UX and the functionality that you're bringing to the user as part of that thing, but not to be worried about the, the down on the weed stack to move content between those things. And we, we, we move all sorts of content, and we today we have systems in the cloud that are that are moving about a billion messages a day uh, in terms of content between uh, mobile things. Great, thank you very much. Um, and next, I'll I'll move on to. Uh, Eugene, uh, Eugene, as you uh, you know, try and take all these different data points and visualize them, right? I mean, that's probably one of the harder things out there to do. Uh, you know, you look at the apps and, and the customization that you guys are providing. Um, you know, what are the challenges that you're still facing um, around you know app development and, and tools to do that? So uh, that's a great question, Alex. So the uh, probably one of the biggest challenges that we're still facing and is, is the maturity of HTML5. Uh, today's, uh, in today's day and age, every every uh, prominent application has to be built in HTML5 and has to be resp responsive and all of those great key terms that everybody is constantly using. Uh, 
However, we are still every day hitting uh, roadblocks where different browsers support different features, different browsers uh, support similar features in a different way, thus you're not getting the expected results. So uh, what we've done essentially is created a platform for this drag and drop to, to try to standardize and abstract all of the different functionalities of the different browsers and the way they handle HTML5 uh, try to abstract that completely away from the developer so they're no longer concerned about uh, writing code specific to any one browser. Uh, we've solved probably about 98% of those discrepancies, but as, as the browsers continue to implement HTML5 and as the browsers continue to implement HTML5 in their own ways, uh, we're, we're, we are converging a bit more to where there is some sort of a standard for HTML5, but it, we're still a, a bit, a bit of time away from that. So I think, I think platforms like uh, what we have, uh, DigiLux with with uh, with a drag and drop stuff that is cross browser, are going to be key to getting more and more developers being able to create applications for uh, the entire web, not just a Safari uh, based web. Great. Thank you. Um, now, Phil, you and I could probably spend the rest of the time that we have for this panel talking about all the challenges that you have to face from the All Seed Alliance because you've got all these behemoths there trying to figure out all these problems, right? And so I, I'm going to kind of narrow it for you here. And, and if we talk about OEMs specifically, original equipment manufacturers, and we try and understand what technology suppliers are trying to address and their challenges, can you speak a little bit about? Um, you know, just those challenges that they're facing in day to day. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I think it's hinted at in some of the discussion, some of the points made so far. But I'm going to come at it in a different approach. Right. Um, it, 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 and that is, look, at the end of the day, we we've been through. You know, I, I think maybe Adam, you you mentioned the M to M world in your your piece, right? Kind of the the beginning, the origins of this. And we, we've now hit the, I could point around the room here in my office to all of the devices I have which live in little proprietary islands, right? They're, they're, it's, a, it's a single device with a single app. I have pages and pages of apps on, you know, one of my beautiful tablet devices that each control a single device. And if I'm so interested, I can use some cloud service like IFTTT to glue those single little islands together into an archipelago of, of mostly connected features as long as I'm willing to deal with the delays of cloud to cloud interactions. What the OEMs really want is the, the next step. They've seen M to M, they've seen the, 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 the islands and archipelagos, but what they really want is just an ecosystem. And that's what they're demanding. And I'm gonna I'm gonna start with, you know, I'm gonna paraphrase a quote from Jan Brockman, the CTO of uh, Electrolux at CES. Jan stood up and said, hey, look, I, I want to pick a standard. I want to support a standard. Now, I, I, I say that with a big smile because he chose mine, right? He chose all, the, all, all, all join as the, the protocol of choice for Electrolux and uh, Electrolux appliances and products. But the, it underlies the, 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 what I think the primary problem is today. The primary problem isn't the things that we're all addressing here in this group, but the, the primary problem is that, look, we don't have five different email programs to deal with email. And, you know, I, I, I agree with the multi-variations on the browser and completely bow my head to you getting 95% of them done, you know, with one tool set, right? But at the end of the day, we still have HTML, and it mostly works across most things, and with good tools, it really works across almost everything. Uh, so we have HTML and we have one of those, but we have an infinite number of IoT standards and, and, and protocols and, and methods for making them all work. And that's really where the problem is. That's what the OEMs are going after. We, they, they need, we need, we all want a single way for devices to talk to each other. And that's really what we're, we're shooting for when we say all seen and all joined. You know, moving on, I think one of the other questions, um, so we actually conducted a uh, IoT index recently on trying to figure out what developers are looking at, and, and one of the questions that we um, kind of brought up was, you know, like open source and the idea of open source protocols and, and, and tools 
And so, Eugene, I'm kind of going to flip to you now and say, you know, do you think that open source is the answer? Is it pervasive in IoT? I mean, for example, you know, I'm reading a quote right now that says over 80% of developers report their companies have policies um, that use open source software. I mean, do you think that's the answer, or what's your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I think uh, there are two points to be made on that. Uh, I absolutely think open source is the answer, and, and the main driving reason for that is I think that connectivity and, and the device intercommunication and, and the sharing of, of this telemetry data uh, has to be and will be commoditized. Uh, th that is not the value. The connectivity is not the end value, and it's not the business value. It's not something that you can come to, to a customer and, uh, and provide an ROI on. Uh, in the near future. As of today, you still a lot of companies still do, but I think in the very, very near future, that is going to get commoditized. So it's extremely open that all of these communications and all of this data sharing and data flow is completely open, com completely accessible, and completely free. Uh, and where companies should be focusing is, rather than uh, focusing on that connectivity and selling that, uh, they should be focusing on providing value on top of that connected data. Uh, whether it's analytics algorithms, control loops, uh, the visualization, uh, whatever it is that the company can bring as a value add on top of all of that free-flowing data, I believe that's where the real value to the customer is. That's where the solutions will come in. Connectivity is just connectivity. What we need to present as an industry to customers are solutions, uh, value-added solutions. Yeah, I'd, Alex, I'd add use cases on that, right? I, I, I think that's what you imply when you say that. Uh, yeah, please. absolutely. Um, oh, sorry, say that again? Wanna, yeah, do you want to continue on that? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to switch over to uh, Adam here. Um, so Adam, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the ability to connect to smartphones and whether it be Android or Apple and kind of you you guys, you know, top that you can connect with any smartphone for that matter. How does the impact of open source in the Android versus Apple kind of affect what you guys are doing? And, and if it doesn't, you know, is do you see open source kind of becoming more pervasive and things like that? Well, I, I think it's interesting that uh, an open source, you know, looking back, like, 10 to, to 20 years ago, open source was something that, that a lot of people would f was kind of fearing that, not knowing where, to, where that was, but today it's just so natural that it's, it's hard to not use open source in whatever software you're creating. If you're building, a, a, we're talking about open, uh, HTML5, if you're building anything on top of, op of HTML5, any app, uh, library framework, anything that you'd find is open source. Uh, if you build anything in the back end side, Whatever you do, you're going to use open source. No JS, uh, you know, Ruby on Rails, whatever. If you're doing it on the on the device side, same goes there. You know, you're using Contiki or something that that's still open source. So, open source is just so pervasive. So I, I, I think the you know, the question is, is there anyone that's not using open source? I, I don't think so. I, I think it's it's very natural. Just part of, of developing software is is going to GitHub, you know, finding something on npm wherever you're doing that. And I think that's, that's just a, a tremendous change. Uh, building back-end applications is just very much easier today just because of open source. Building smartphone app applications, HTML5, just so easy today thanks to open source. So definitely uh, open source is there. It, it's yeah. unquestionable. Great. And, and um, kind of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it to you, Alex, with obviously the opportunity to, to comment on that. But the other thing I wanted to ask you as well is, you know, kind of what key languages, you know, you know, um, Adam was just rattling off a bunch of different languages and, and you know, tools. Um, what key languages do you think will end up surviving and kind of leading the way um, in addition to the open source question? Yeah, th thanks for that. I, mean, I think th there's no question uh, every developer is going to use open source and as much open source as they can in terms of building what they can to get to market as fast as they can. I mean, and that's and that and that's what the developer is trying to do. Is trying to get his piece of functionality, his thing, and his and his his system to market as absolutely as fast as possible. And uh, and I think what you know, with some organizations like like with what Golgi offers, we offer a, we offer a component to speed up that ability for that developer to get to market faster by taking a, a small piece of that functionality from end to end across the the full the full spectrum of requirements. 
so whether the developer, and we're seeing uh, prototype developers working in Arduino, we're seeing prototype developers working in Intel Edison, and Intel Galileo boards, we're seeing prototype developers building backend servers in Node, building Android and iOS, native systems on Android and iOS. Uh, we're seeing uh, we're seeing native with very low level C and IP stacks on things, and people building C code and and even sometimes building very rudimentary C compilers on very small things uh, to connect those. Uh, so 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 I don't think there's there's any one size fit, fits all, and I think and that and that's kind of the opportunity for us all in in the tool set environment is that there is quite a complex array of systems being joined together. To build a a a a an Internet of Things an Internet of Things world, um, and uh, and I think you know, we've seen lots of lots of lots of uh, free th free stuff uh, like 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 Node um, being used and being used at the back end servers as it's, as we're seeing developers coming out of college with that kind of competence and being very fast to build that thing. Um, whereas uh, you know developers that came out years years ago were using Java, were using C++, and then before that were using C. So we're seeing a lot more prevalence of you know, the more modern computer language, object oriented computer languages coming to use now. Great. And uh, last to you, Phil. Um, you know, if you look at kind of all join under the all seen lines and kind of what you guys are doing today, I'd love for you to kind of share with the community how you're addressing the open source issues and and things like that. Yeah, I mean, we are open source, right? We're the Linux Foundation. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so uh, I, I, I thank you for the giant endorsement of what we do. Uh, it's one yeah. of the reasons that it's, it's, it's one of the primary reasons I'm here working with the All Seen Alliance is because it's open source. Um, I, I, I'll add some caveats on it for the listeners. I, I'm speaking to the panel when I say this, but for caveats for the listeners, you know, you have to understand the terms of the open source. Open source isn't a thing. It's a whole ecology of things. And so o o o o open source is complicated in that you have to understand the terms of use when open source is presented to you. And that means that you just have to, um, you know, you, you, you have to read through and, and, and make conscious decisions with open source. We've made a conscious decision in the alliance with all join. You know, it, it's completely open source. It's under ISC license for inbound and outbound contributions. But, you know, it, the, the IP policy puts a little caveat on that. And the caveat is very straightforward. We believe that interoperability is so important that if you want the benefits of the IP policy, which is, you know, it's free to use, it's free, it, 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 it's free to include in your products. If you want that IP benefit, we ask you to certify your product to demonstrate that you have implemented the protocol correctly and that your products work with others because we as an alliance think that that's so important that we, we've added that as kind of our caveat on, on open source. There are lots of other caveats on open source and you know whoever writes the license gets to put the terms and conditions on it. That's our one term and condition um, but I, I raise that in, in, in this context because you really have to understand as you're looking through licenses and, and open source code What's behind that? Do, do, you know, is there a license that's required to go along with the, the software license for the technology and the intellectual property that's embedded in, in the software? Is that all included there you know, in, in an open way? Is it not? Do you, do, do you understand all of the things you're signing on for when you say yes with, with, with any piece? We've tried to be very clear with that um, to, to drive our mission which is billions of things working together. And, and you know, I, I think in the context of the question, the, 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 the caveat is make sure you understand all of the terms, uh, not just the license on the software, but the license on the technology that's embedded in the software when you go forward and use it so that you as a company, you know, be you an, an entrepreneur or, or, or a major, major multinational, really have those terms in hand so that when your product is in market, you can strongly describe what it means to be using those pieces of open source in that product. So Phil, I'm actually going to uh, stick with you here um, and, and uh, ask you, you mentioned interoperability and um, w one of the things that I, I found interesting, uh, you know, as we were preparing for this panel is you know, I was listening to the last panel, and, and you had, like, embedded guys in one part of the organization, and you had, uh, like, web service developers in the other or, uh, side of the organization, okay? And the embedded guys were pointing to the web services saying it's their fault, 
And on the same side, the web services guys are pointing and saying, no, it's the embedded guy's fault. And so when you talk about interoperability, how do you think DevTools can kind of play a leading role to ensure that moving forward we can address interoperability? Yeah, I, uh, it's, it, it's a great question. I'll start from our premise. Our premise is that things need to talk, be able to talk to each other, whatever things mean. And that, that the cloud plays a very important role, but you need, to, you need to understand the cloud's role versus the thing's role. And I think a lot of that previous panel's discussion uh, of, you know, the embedded guys, the things versus the cloud and, and interop is a confusion of those two topics. Look, you, you, I, if I have telemetry data, I want to have a, a, a thing, something in here, this LG TV, which runs all joint sitting behind me, I want that to be able to send telemetry data, but I want that to do it in an organized and controlled and open way so that it, it's understood through that whole path. On the other hand, if I pick up an app, right, I pick up an app on here that, that understands how to orchestrate these smart connected things that, that are all around me, I just wanted to talk to them and there's no reason for it to go out through the cloud up to come back down to talk to my devices. And so, you know, to, 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 to your question, I, I, I think that interop begins with an understanding of what you want to have interop. And th there's lots of layers in this whole stack. Uh, Adam, you and I for a long time have talked about this. When I was back at Zively, we, 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 we talked about all of these pieces, right? There's the, how do my devices talk to each other? How do my devices get identity? How do my devices get provisioned? How do my devices get activated? How do my devices send telemetry data? How do my devices store state somewhere else? How do I get remote access to my devices? How do I remote manage my devices? Those are all pieces of the, the question. We in the Alliance have taken two real careful stances there towards interoperability. We've said, look, devices to devices, I completely agree with a couple of statements I've heard. Uh, are, that, that's getting commoditized. We want to make that open source and commoditize that. And it should be simple, open, and you should be able to pick the models you want. The security of that, the, the onboarding of that, the firmware updates of that, all the things that all the members on, on, on the panel here do, our value adds on top of that. They don't necessarily have to be interoperable as long as they, there are interoperable ways that they can talk to the devices that they want to talk to. At the same time, things like data probably do, does want to be open and interoperable. And we've created just something we call a gateway agent, which is how a local thing talks to the cloud. But we haven't defined what's on the cloud side. We've just defined what's on the thing to the gateway side to give people the, the, the richness of being able to add their capabilities on the end. So we've picked some very careful spots around interoperability and, and, and said that it's really about devices talking to each other, devices, apps talking to each other on the local network, which is the primary level of interoperability we need to get first. When we get to there, we can start walking up the stack, but you can't eat the elephant, right? You've got to eat, a, eat, eat it a spoon at a time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well put. Uh, Eugene, do you have any comments on interoperability? And yeah, absolutely, and I, I agree with everything Philip said. Kind of, there has to be a starting point, and device to device is definitely one of those points. I think it's also important to mention the importance of edge and, and fog compute. Uh, you don't necessarily want all devices going directly to the cloud and pulling in all of the raw data that which you know 70% of may be irrelevant to the use case. Uh, so it's it's about connecting devices to each other. It's about connecting to devices to fog nodes. It's about doing edge compute and fog compute for some sort of analytics, data filtering, data aggregation, and then pushing only the relevant data up to the cloud. Uh, that way you're, you're not, you're not uh, overloading the network. You're not, uh, you don't need a significant data center infrastructure for, uh, you know, to handle all of the raw data, which again, it's probably more like 85 to 90 percent of the data. The raw data is, is not needed. If it's pre-processed at the edge, and then moved up to the cloud for further processing and only the relevant data is passed, that really is the key. Um, on you, Alps, comments? Yeah, um, yeah, you mentioned the, the, the issue between the, the thing and the back-end server developers and they're kind of blaming each other about uh, you know, what functionality is where and what protocols are where and what data is going between those components and how to get that interaction right. And, and you've got two development teams in two different parts of the organization. So, so what we've done in Golgi, we've defined this data contract that defines the interactions between the things and your mobile app or your things and your servers. And that generates native code on the basis of that contract, between uh, native code for the thing and for the 
for the mobile app or indeed for the back end server, whatever whatever endpoints you're using, it generates native code. So that so that so that contract becomes the discussion point for your multiple development teams, your Android development teams, your iOS development teams, your 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 thing development teams, your back end server development teams, to agree what the interface between all of those uh, components are. And then we'll generate all the code and just each of the developers then calls that piece of code that's been generated by us and magically the content that they wish to transfer arrives on the other side of that uh, of, of that uh, of that pipe effect. Right. So I, I think in general uh, interoperability on the device side is is really hard. That's that's what people have been struggling for years on end, trying to make things like Zigbee work or or uh, uh, any of the other uh, wireless uh, alliances around that's been around for for many years. It's really hard and. Uh, uh, I think personally that the first step is is creating products that bring value to people who are using them. That that might be you know maybe that's a whole screen full of apps, and, um, and that's fine. Kind of a, the, the first step, uh, and only then can we really see people wanting to have interoperability on the device side. I mean, really want it, where we have a a, a, a pull not just from the uh, producers, but also from the end consumer, the end user of the product is going to really want to have these things working together. Maybe it's time for that now. Maybe the OC Alliance might be the, kind of the first uh, uh, group that really tackles this in a, in a successful way. And, and I, I, you know, it's a future that I think a lot, most of us want to see. It's just really, really hard to get there. And so far, I think that the easiest way of, of moving towards interoperability between different platforms, different uh, apps, if you wish, or different products, is to do that on the cloud side. I mean, we have things like IFTTT that have been able to do this, really bring in interoperability, but going through to the cloud uh, and, and their way of doing that. So uh, I, I think what, you know, we're, we're moving forward to this, and, and we might see the, the interoperability on the device side coming through sometime soon, but it, it's, a, it's a really tough match to, to get there. Uh, in terms of the, the question on, on do we see the, the back-end people and the, the embedded people inside an organization kind of struggling against each other? I think what we're moving towards there is a greater criminality between these two groups of, of people. It used to be that you'd have a, a wireless protocol stack that the embedded guys were very familiar with, and you'd have a kind of an internet protocol stack that the back-end side people were very familiar with. What we're seeing now, and I think also the OCL and Alliance is, is what was pushing this as well, is uh, everything coming together and using the same kind of internet thinking all the way down to the to the embedded nodes, all, all the way out to the wireless end of the this, this, this spectrum. So we're we're having this, we're speaking the same language. I mean, everyone talks about the, the, the same types of protocols, the same types of thinking, which I think helps a lot. From all the way from the app developer to the uh, through the the back end side, uh, the, the back end software developers all the way out to the to the uh, firmware developers, we're all seeing that coming together, and you know, moving forward, this might help towards getting the uh, uh, device uh, devices working together directly as well. But I, I think we, we still have a ways to go there. Um, and so I don't know if the panelists know this, but we actually do uh, take questions from the audience, and we had a uh, question directed at Phil, and and really, um, Phil, I'll just go ahead and announce it, and then give you a chance to respond, but. The question is, you know, what's the significance of Microsoft joining all Steam Alliance, and how does that impact uh, in Linux? Yeah, great, and I'm going to answer that in the context of what uh, what Adam just said because I think it goes that well. Adam, yeah. today there are about 10 million products in market that are running uh, all join, and so that's an it's a, it's a substantial number. It's not enough to to to, to be giant yet, but it's a, it's a real number of products. Uh, with, with Microsoft coming on board and their announcements at WinHEC, you know, that number is going to reach a billion by the end of the year. And so a billion starts to be a real number of smart connected things all talking the same language. And the, 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 you know, the, I think there are two real big aspects of Microsoft joining that were exciting for me as part of the alliance. Uh, the, the first was, hey, look, Microsoft has put all join, it's open source software, into the core of Windows. Windows is shipping with, with, with an open piece of open source code in it 
that implements an open source protocol stack, and that's a big thing. So from a Linux perspective, what does that mean? It means that a, a, a Linux-enabled device and an embedded-enabled device and a Microsoft-enabled device can all talk together using the same protocol stack, and guess what? They're all using the same code. That's the magic of open source. That's what we all want, right? Nobody wants to re-implement the uh, HTTP server again. We all use Apache or some other HTTP server that you know is widely adopted. In the same way, we don't want everybody having to re-implement this really detailed protocol called Aldrin. We want people using it. So Microsoft coming in is, I think, a giant validation for the whole model of open source. Uh, the impact on Linux, it just means that there's more things that talk our, our, our protocol. It's built into the core OS. It's built into the Win32 API. If Windows is the platform you like to build on, it's now easy to add all join into that. You know, it's a simple API call. Just like if you like building on an embedded box, you can download the embedded build. And if you like building uh, on Linux or OpenWRT, you can open those builds. We, we're, we're now on just, you know, an, another dominant big platform, and that's really awesome. Great. That's but very helpful. I think it goes to this point, Adam, that you were raising, which is, it, to me is really critical, which is you know, we, we need to get to mass. It, the, 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 the protocol is l less important than a protocol. And I, and I use those words really carefully. We need a protocol to, to use. Nobody liked having Prodigy websites and AOL websites and Gopher and, and, and all other things along with different versions of HTTP, HTML, you know, best one viewed with this browser on this computer at this resolution at this color depth. Nobody wanted that. And we all don't want to go to the store and have to make a decision of these three products or those three products because they speak the same language. We want products, and, and we want them all to work. Great. Awesome. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, turn the panel over a little bit to the other three, and I, I want to talk. I'm going to start with you, uh, Alex. And one of the things you know that we're trying to do here is just kind of uh, I go back to answering or addressing the unanswered questions, and and you know what I always get is can you show me? Can you can you give me an example? of how you all are using tools to address problems and, and can you give me a use case of a customer or um, of a specific you know instance where um, your tools and, and your services are really helping in solving those questions? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. Thank you very much. So we, so we have a customer who is um, building a simply a door switch and an IoT door switch and they wanted to simply uh, they're, they're a hardware manufacturer and they wanted to simply make that door switch work from a mobile app. And the, the complexity that that manufacturer had to do to make that door switch work from that mobile app before we got involved was huge. Um, so what we were able to do was give them a, a, a layer of software that generated native code. Uh, it's happened to his, 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 door, his door switch ran on a, a small operating system running C. Uh, we were able to give them an Android and iOS component that was able to generate native code on those components. We were able to give them a cloud service for moving data between his door switch and between his mobile app so that he could actually press a button on his mobile app that would actually open his door. He was able to then add a camera um, to, the, to the door switch component, to the door, to, the door, to the door itself, and he was able to then, when somebody was walking up to the door, see who was coming and see who was at that door. And he was able to do that by, by focusing on the functionality that he wanted, but not on the requirements of moving data between his switch and his mobile app, or, or, or trying to understand push notification servers, not trying to un understand uh, Android communication protocol stacks, or iOS protocol stacks, or indeed what happens if the mobile app at this particular point is not running on the device? What happens if the mobile app is actually out of coverage? How does, when somebody comes to the door, how does he notify them? How is this? How, how is he get a look at what's going on in the door? So all he had to do was kind of uh, define his data transport, define what he wanted between his door switch and his mobile app, and we completely looked after the rest. And then uh, next, I'm going to switch over to Eugene. Uh, Eugene, would you mind uh, sharing with the audience for everyone who's listening, kind of a use case or example where you are helping a customer? Sure. Uh, so. It's, a, it's an interesting question for us because the way we go to market is actually through distribution and through resellers. And I think our customers are actually our distributors, not necessarily the end users. 
And one of the biggest things, uh, uh, one of the biggest value adds that we're able to provide for these customers who are distributors, who, mind you, are not developers. They're systems integrators that are trained in one specific vertical that they that they do. Uh, for them to be able to, in the field, very quickly configure custom applications for their for their clients. They may start with templates, they may start with a blank screen and then just build it from scratch, but it's very important that they're actually able to do so without having to write code, especially in the field. Uh, and, and, you know, mistakes are prompted. If, if you're going in the field and you're writing code, uh, you're guaranteed to make a whole bunch of mistakes and have a whole bunch of bugs. Uh, it's very important, the visual configuration. Once you get there on the field, it's just a couple of clips, clicks of the mouse, a couple of drag actions, and you've configured the, 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 uh, the interface for that custom client. Uh, to focus on specifically a, a building automation example uh, or, or a data center example, uh, you know, Stanford is actually one of the, uh, one of the universities that is using our technology uh, in all of their data centers. And what they needed was essentially a way to monitor their POE, their, their system health, and, and do the whole data center infrastructure management. They're using our tools to do that. There's new requirements coming into facilities management, to data center management. There's new requirements coming in every day in terms of what needs to be changed, what needs to be added, the sort of calculations that are being displayed, etc. So there, Stanford actually themselves, as an end user, learned to use our technology and learned to actually make those modifications themselves. Again, none of those guys are developers. All of those guys are either facilities guys or data center ma management guys. Uh, and it, I think it's just uh, the next revolution is to enable guys like that who are essentially domain experts in their field but don't necessarily know anything about writing code. Uh, to enable those guys to actually be able to get get value out of uh, the data that they have available at their fingertips. Great, and uh, Adam, to you. Uh, I think I'm just going to. It seems like I'm reiterating what what everyone else is saying here. That that uh, I, I think a lot of, of customers are are just you know experts in their field, and they really like to have this way of either it's going to be an app to control. The, the product or uh, some way to, to interact with the data and uh, it's really hard for, for an expert in, in their field to go about and do that so just one example we had a, a customer in a, it's, it's a very innovative lighting uh, manufacturer they, they were doing indoor lighting large scale uh, think large office buildings or industrial scale things they were really really good at LEDs optics you know, enclosures heat sinks all the, the kind of really hard stuff that, that goes into making a, a really uh, great lighting, uh, a great light. Uh, so what they wanted to do was a way for their customers to, to turn on and off and schedule uh, the light to, through their smartphone apps uh, or through their smartphones. And uh, when we added our, our platform to this, uh, with a microcontroller wireless system on a chip, uh, through the back-end system and, and to a smartphone app. We had, in literally two days, we had a fully branded uh, app in the hand of our customer controlling their light. Uh, and and I, I think that the key to all this is you have to take that, just, just find out that the really hard parts in the middle there and be able to deliver that simply and easily to, to the customer who, who are specialists in their own, in their field. Just make it a, a very simple interface, a way to, to bind this together to whatever equipment that, that you're doing at, on, on the one end and to something that you can show to your customers on the other end. That's a smartphone app, now, iOS, Android. Uh, you get, get that as quickly as possible into the hands of, of the end user and suddenly, you know, in, in, in the matter of a few days or a week, you start iterating with your customer, you know, thinking about how, how will people actually use this, what's the value that, that the end user is going to get from this. Uh, you can show to stakeholders of other uh, kinds, investors, uh, say, hey, you know, this is this is the way this isn't going to work. And right now, it's, it, or I guess uh, up to now, it's been really hard to do that just because there's been so much technology in the middle of that that's been very, very hard. But I think what a lot of us are doing is just making all that a lot easier and, and finding out this interface to, to both the manufacturer's product and the end user on the app side. 
and you're suddenly you can start experimenting and do and take the, the value and find it where that is uh, in your next product. Yeah, you know, and I would echo what you were saying that you know people um, on the panel are saying similar things, right? And and people are facing different challenges or the similar challenges. But the you know what I find interesting about all of this is that. Uh, you know, I've heard lighting, I've heard building automation, I've heard data centers, I've heard door switches. I'm going to switch the ball back over to Phil now, and I'm kind of curious because in our world, the way we segment the world, you know, those are different venues. So lighting's within buildings or data centers within professional IT infrastructure, things like that. Um, Phil, I guess the question I have for you is you sit at the all seam Alliance, right, and, and you have different in companies coming from different industries, and, and, and I just am curious, like, what are some of the industries or applications that you're seeing, like, strong adoption in today um, with some of these solutions and things like that? Uh, the, the dominant one and the, the one that, we, that, that, that comes from our heritage it, it, it is really in the home automation space. Right, that's the first. That, that's the first big area, and that's because that's where the first group of members came from. And if you look at the home automation space, and I think the door lock example was a great example. Um, the, the the use cases that people want to build aren't complicated. They aren't these magical mystery use cases with super smart houses doing omniscient things for us. They're, they're you know, did the kids leave the refrigerator door open? If they did, send them a reminder that tells them to close the refrigerator door. Did I leave the garage door open at night? Is the dishwasher leaking? Like these are like the things we want to automate. And so the first wave are these. When you have that and when you start to get those companies who make products in that space, white goods, consumer electronics, building and enabling their products in a similar way, you can get to the second tier. A, a, a really big domain we're, we're, we're seeing growing right now is around grid and energy management, the grid interconnect. Because when you, you know, we have members like a company, uh, a relatively new startup called House that's looking at zero energy housing. And they, they're, they're looking at how do I now have the grid and the smarter appliances start talking to each other? Because guess what? The, the smarter appliances have a standard protocol and I have a way to talk to them. How do I affect that protocol? This is where open source comes in. How do I affect that protocol in such a way that I can ensure that I can talk to those appliances and give them hints about what's going on in the world around them. You know, dryer, it's not a good time to run right now because the grid is really overtaxed. I suggest <laughs> you run in three hours. Well, if I can give that hint to a user, that's an important thing. Same thing with a washing machine. You know, maybe you have solar and you want it, that. So the, the home automation, uh, energy, lighting is an obvious one. You know, as we transition to smart digital connected lighting, it's obvious to add connectivity in there. The first really big consumer product, LifeX, uh, in the you know in the in in, in the personal lighting space, uh, runs all join on it. You, you go to Best Buy and buy those, right? And so we're starting to see more. We have other members like Lumen Cash that are building more complex industrial use cases, and then the the, the last are these enterprise use cases. Uh, we 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 we've got. Um, members who've built bridges between uh, existing installed based technologies like BACnet and AllJoin so that th they can start to expand the enterprise use cases. And what, what we'd all like as consumerization happens in, a, in our life here, right? We have a smart, I have a Honeywell thermostat. It's awesome. I can get to it from wherever I am. Well, guess what? When I go into the office, I expect the same capabilities, just like I expected them when I con uh, I got consumerization with you know you know BYOD is now becoming BYOT, right? Bring your own thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and in the enterprise use case, what I really like to do is get into my office, take out my smart device, and change the temperature in it because my office temperature probably shouldn't be the same as yours it, 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 for our our personal comfort levels. The, the HVAC systems are capable of that. It's the software layer and, and, and the application layer that, that don't exist right now to make that happen. And that's the real big expansion area we're seeing right now is in this industrial and enterprise use cases. Not giant turbines, not you know the, the hydroelectric plants or nuclear power plants, but office buildings, small, small industry, small commercial enterprises, they're all looking at this. And then finally, um, I'll call it the infrastructure piece, and it's implied. You know, I think Adam and I is one of the first things he and I talked about like three years ago when we first met and talked was around provisioning and management, et cetera. 
you know, I as a product maker have one set of needs to provision devices, manage devices, and support devices. I as, say, a cable company or a cell phone operator have a different set of uses, uh, use cases around that. And we're starting to see that really come to the fore. You know, we had a member just announced that they're open sourcing TR69 connectors into the all join world, which means anybody with a TR69 platform can now manage the all join devices inside of a household just like they can manage the access point into that household. Well, that, that doesn't matter for me as a homeowner, and it probably doesn't matter for you know, a company making a single product, but it really does matter if you're a cable company or a cell company that's trying to offer great service to your customers and you want to offer the support and service. And so those are really the areas. And then finally, you know, a, a, as a, uh, to, to not leave Eugene's domain out of this at all, analytics and all of the data around support service operations visualization is is really starting to bubble up as a domain unto itself because we're starting to get enough devices in the market that you can do that with and make interesting statements around yeah and you know what you're actually leading me into my my next point um, I wanted to go to Eugene here and then I'm going to jump to Adam and Alex for a final word but Eugene kind of looking at analytics and and looking into the future and, and thinking about uh, moving forward, you know, where do you kind of see the markets and opportunities? And you mentioned Stanford earlier, some of the other markets uh, that are popping up on your guys' radar. You know, uh, right now, uh, I think very hot markets right now where a lot of folks are focusing on and very large multinational organization or fo organizations are focusing on are oil and gas. Uh, that's an extremely hot market right now. Uh, industrial manufacturing is huge retail and healthcare we see those four markets as very very rapid growth markets uh, residential home automation of course always has been and always will be I believe uh, very very quick uh, to grow and then probably the uh, the home automation is probably going to be that vertical which is going to have the, the, the fastest growth in terms of available devices uh, but there's a lot of focus going into oil and gas, retail, healthcare, and industrial. And, and I think the reason for that is just because of the significant amount of cost savings that can be, that can result in automating very little, uh, very, very small steps within the process. Those, those automations can actually result in, and th that connectivity kind of can result in, uh, I think Cisco predicted it to be $19 trillion value at stake. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine on that $19 trillion. But, right. um, so uh, going to just finish up here, Alex, and I'll start with you, Alex. Any final words on markets or opportunities that you kind of see moving forward? Yeah, so I think I think we're seeing the, the, the home, and we're seeing the standards drive in the home as having a big impact. Um, I think the all join and the OIC and the work that's going on there is very interesting. And uh, I think that's driving activity in the home. Uh, we're seeing lots of joiners for both of those standards bodies. I think Apple is also going to drive the home as well. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of activity in that. I, th I think the, the kind of the place where the standards bodies are, tend not to be working is in the oil and gas and in, in, uh, in industrial and in smart grid. And, in, uh, and we're seeing, seeing a lot of activity there. And I think the last, the last bit of activity that we're seeing really is in, is in, is in eco. It's kind of building stuff to keep... Um, to keep countries, to keep nations, to keep cities smart, and to keep them uh, to keep them eco-friendly, and we're seeing that that kind of that market sector of eco-friendly systems and eco-friendly sensors and eco-friendly cities is becoming a becoming a, a big driving force of IoT. Great, and uh, to Adam for the final word, my friend. Oh yeah, so. Uh, I guess the in terms of markets, what everyone is seeing right now is, is the home automation thing. You know, everyone is, is want to go into that. You see all the big guys going there, and of course, it's going to be something. And you know, who knows how big that's going to be? It's been it's been around for for many years. Who knows? But I think what's interesting is that it's not just it's not going to be just one big market. I think that's what we've been hearing also from the panel now. It's it's not just this one huge market that's going to take everyone uh, and with them. But we're seeing this in, in so many different verticals. We're seeing it in, in various industrial verticals, home automation, consumer products, healthcare, medicine. And, and that, I think, is the, the really exciting part with this, is this has a, has a chance to really disrupt everything. Right? You know, it, it's going to be in everything that we're going to see from you know, consumer appliances, sports equipment, 
into huge industrial machinery, you know, airplanes, all the big stuff. And I think that's what makes this so interesting. It's going into everything. It's not just one single market. And be, you know, there's going to be lots and lots of startups taking on this. That's going to be one huge area of, of you know, in five years from now, the big companies are not even created today. Of course, we're going to see a lot of big startups uh, coming out. Of course, we're going to see a lot of different innovation in larger uh, existing companies as well. But I think that, that, that what we are seeing, and I think the message that I'd like to give is that this just goes into everything. Uh, all the markets out there is going to have to be prepared to deal with this. Uh, the trick, of course, is, is to find the value in each and every market, and I think we're all going to, to, to show uh, what this value is, and I think that's what all the panelists here are, are agreeing with that. You know, we're taking on these markets one by one, but it's going to be huge. Awesome. Thank you, and uh, that's a wonderful bookshelf you have behind you, by the way. I really like all the, uh, you got a lot up there. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, for anyone who has questions, please feel free to reach out to any of these individuals regarding specific questions you may have had as a result of the panel.